Hi, it's Steve. Today is day 12 of the 30 days of video series and also water fasting at the same time. A quick update on the water fast. It's still going great. I have really good energy, uh, especially yesterday my energy was great. I went for an hour-long walk last night um, around 8 p.m. and just felt like extra strong, like maybe almost back to normal, how I would, be, how I would feel energetically if I was eating. Um, I'm definitely getting used to not eating. It's uh, you know, it's like a rhythm you have to get into psychologically. There's a big adjustment there, but I definitely feel like I'm picking that up now, and it's, and I feel like I could definitely coast for a while, the way I'm going. It hasn't been particularly difficult. Today was great. I got a good full work day in yesterday, a good full work day in today, so that's really nice to have the productivity back up again. I was pretty sluggish the first week, but I seem to be past that now. Of course, on a fast, it can be hard to predict, you know, how you're going to be each day, so the energy can roller coaster a little bit. Um, but so far, so good. So um, I'll see how long I can go like this. If I can go another f little over five more days, then I'll pass my previous record of 17 days. So that's pretty cool. Um, the topic I want to talk about today is not super complicated. It's just about learning from failure. So what is a failure? A failure is when you have an expectation that wasn't met. You know, you expect something to happen and you get a different result. So you take an action and you're hoping for one result and you get some kind of other result that you didn't want. That's basically a failure experience. Um, of course, that can happen for a variety of reasons. It could happen through circumstances that feel completely outside your control. Uh, but if the failure was a big surprise to you, it means some for some reason your expectations are out of alignment with reality. And this is this is a real um, truth-based lesson here, is, is that you ultimately want to get your expectations closer into alignment with reality so that you can take the actions that will actually get the results you want instead of constantly being disappointed when you put a lot of effort into something and the result you get is dismal. <laughs> um, so you basically have, you know, let's let's put it down to say three options you have for how to react to that kind of experience when you have a failure experience. Uh, option number one is that you can place the blame externally. You can make it somebody else's fault or the fault of the universe, the fault of your boss, your spouse, your kids, somebody else out there. Um, you know, somebody messed you up. Somebody tripped you up. Maybe they even did it on purpose. Sometimes that's not necessarily, you know, a, a bad way to start, <laughs> um, but ultimately it's a bit self-defeating because um, if you start placing the blame externally, then you can't really grow through that experience and you can't really learn from it as well. You might just learn a, a really basic lesson of avoiding somebody who screwed you over uh, or who caused a failure and, you know, that's okay, but you might be able to learn a broader lesson if you dive a little deeper. The second option is to blame yourself. So place the blame internally instead of externally. So that's when you start beating yourself up and putting yourself down and saying, you know, I suck and I'm no good at this. And, and all that does is just lower your self-esteem. That is uh, just a, f a foolish option <laughs> for the most part. And part of the reason is that our, our brains are programmed by input and all input is a form of programming. Anything that comes to you through your sensory experience, including the experiences you're generating internally, that helps to program your brain. And if you start giving yourself negative self-feedback and, and placing it, you know, placing the blame on yourself and um, beating yourself up and taking the failure so personally, you're basically degrading your software. It'd be like, a, you know, if your computer self-installed a virus or your phone self-installed a virus because it doesn't like itself. <laughs> so it decides it's going to beat itself up and slow itself down on purpose. That, that would make no sense. You obviously wouldn't want hardware that did that. Um, and that's essentially what you're doing to yourself when you start beating yourself up. The reason I, t I don't engage in that behavior is that I just know it's, it's, it's a form of self-programming. And why on earth... Would I want to do that? How can that possibly help me? All that's going to do is hurt hurt me more. So it, it doesn't make any sense if you want to be intelligent to engage in that kind of behavior. Uh, so I tend to immediately turn to the third option, which is to find the disconnect between 
my expectations and the results I got. For some reason, I had an expectation that was out of alignment with, with reality. So instead of blaming myself, like the hardware of who I am, I, I look to the software, the programs, the mental programs that are running in my mind. And that's something I don't take so personally. I don't identify that as myself. It's just my, you know, it's just beliefs and thoughts and feelings uh, and so on. And that can be changed without me feeling like I'm, you know, gutting myself and changing who I am. So the, you know, the key here is to find out what was the cause? What, um, where did that, you know, expectation come from that got you so, you know, out of alignment with the way reality actually works? Uh, so I'll, I'll share a couple different examples from my life. They're not that complicated, um, you know, just to illustrate this. So uh, in 1999, I went bankrupt. In my first five years to keep trying to get my computer games business running, I had the expectation that what I was doing, I was working very hard, um, would make money. <laughs> and I thought it would lead to some kind of success. I thought it would get, you know, certain games published and... They would be well received and I would get royalty checks on them from the publishers I was working with. And instead, that wasn't the result I got. The result I got was, um, you know, just having projects canceled, basically. Um, and, and, you know, of course, that was very disappointing. It was a lot of hard work for very little results. I expected my in income to go up from what I was doing. And instead, I just sank into debt and went bankrupt. So it was pretty much completely the opposite of what I expected. Now, I could have engaged in a period of like beating up the publishers I worked with and placing the blame on them. And to some extent, I did that. You know, I did indulge in that. Just, you know, like you get upset, of course. So I had that reaction phase. Um, I didn't indulge in the whole internal blame thing. I just, you know, for decades, I've considered that just a waste of time and effort. Um, but then I, I really spent some thought on, okay, where's the disconnect here? Why did I get this result when I was expecting the opposite? I've put in five years of hard work on this, and clearly something's not working. So I thought, there must be something in my mental software that's off. Uh, and the, the culmination of that was when I got a notice tacked on my apartment door that said I had three days to move out because I hadn't paid the rent in a while. <laughs> um, so that, that really sucked, too. So I was, I was living in Marina del Rey, California at the time, and I walked down, I went for a long walk along the beach, and went down to the Santa Monica Pier, and I sat down on the sand, and I just said, okay, I'm gonna just sit on the sand here and think about this. And it was a beautiful day outside, and the, you know, the kids were playing outside, and uh, the ocean waves are crashing against the shore, and there's seagulls flying overhead, um, and I could smell the salty air. So it was a nice place to sit for a bit. Uh, and, and uh, I just sat there for like two, three hours just pondering, how did I get to this point? Like, what happened? What, what mistake in, in, in my thinking did I make? And, you know, ultimately I thought, okay, well, it seemed like for me at least it was a mistake to work with publishers the way I was doing. Um, but I ultimately boiled it down to that, uh, you know, I was attracting the wrong people uh, to work with. I was attracting people who were just like dishonest or incompetent. Like the first publisher I worked with, later on, they they were sued by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and, and found to you know have, have done all this accounting fraud, and they were fined like tens of millions of dollars, and their CEO was fined as well. And I thought, yeah, well, that's <laughs> no surprise to me, you know, given the kind of ethics I saw in that company. Um, but I thought, why did I why did I choose to work with that person? And I realized there were all these warning signs I avoided. Uh, the previous developer who had worked with them was bad-mouthing all over the industry because he had such a terrible time with them. And, you know, I, who knows the truth of that story? Uh, <laughs> I'm not really concerned with whose fault it was. But there were certain warning signs going into it that this may not be a good deal. Um, and I kind of ignored them. And then I thought, okay, you know, you keep asking why as you go down this thought process. Why? Why did I make that assumption? Why did I think this? And ultimately, when I traced it down far enough, I, I realized, you know, it came from the, the real problem was that I was focusing on the money. I was focusing on trying to make money and pursuing success. And I thought, you know what? I think that's what actually led me into the trap because I wasn't paying enough attention to other things. I wasn't paying enough, enough attention to my happiness, to the enjoyment of my work, to 
creating value for the player. I was trying to create value for the publisher too much. And I thought, you know, basically it was just an overweighting problem. I was overweighting certain factors that I shouldn't have. And I was underweighting other factors that I thought were less important. I was doing things during that time, like just working crazy hours, working weekends, not taking any vacations, um, sleeping at my office. Um, I, you know, I, uh, Aaron and I got married during that time. We got married in 1998, a year before the bankruptcy. And, you know, it was just like so busy. We only took like a, maybe a, like a four day honeymoon. That was about it. And it was, it was to Las Vegas. It was like driving, uh, flying. We flew from LA to Vegas and then we spent like four days there and then came back and it was like right back to work. So that was kind of, you know, like an unbalanced lifestyle to be sure. And when I, you know, when I gave that some serious thought, I just thought, you know, can that really be the case? Do I, you know, like if I, um, if I had put lifestyle factors higher up and lowered the weight of things like money, financial gain, um, you know, would like, and uh, success in the industry, making a name for myself, creating a hit, would that have been a better, would that have led to a better outcome? And the answer was, I didn't really know. But I thought, you know what? I've done five years down the wrong path, so what have I got to lose? And I encourage you, when you come up with you know, an explanation for your failure experience, you may not know what a better belief is or a better expectation is, but at least dismiss the idea of continuing along the wrong path, along the path that you know has not worked out for you. At least try something new, try something different. Be open-minded about that. So I was in a very humble and open-minded place at that point because I was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to end up declaring bankruptcy here. That was inevitable. And um, so I was in a very reflective mood and really eager to learn. And at this point, I wasn't too upset about the experience. I was more just surrendered to it. I was like, okay, it'll suck to have to scramble to find another place to live in three days, but you know, we'll work that out. We'll solve these problems one at a time. And then I was really concer you know, concerned about like, what's, you know, like, how do I get my my thoughts and beliefs, my mental programming, better alignment with what I can expect from reality. And when I made those changes and I, I decided to start making some big you know, shifts in my life and how I prioritize things, I started another game project up and I did things very differently. I, I just, uh, you know, I focused on the enjoyment of the experience, the creative self-expression. I, I did something I hadn't done before, which was reach out and start networking a lot in the industry. I began writing articles. I began making more friends who are other game developers. I started volunteering in a trade association. I put so much emphasis on different areas that I was underweighting before. And I thought, okay, maybe that will lead to a better result. And sure enough, it did. Like it was night and day, just massive transformation. My business started doing well. The game I created won several awards. It did well financially. I enjoyed my life a lot more. And, you know, I, I ran that business successfully for another five years without issue until I was interested in retiring by choice because I wanted to bet on something even bigger, uh, which was my personal growth business, which has been going well for the past 12 and a half years now. So, um, you know, getting that shift in my beliefs was really powerful. And if I placed the blame on other people, I probably would have stayed stuck where I was. And if I placed the blame on myself, that would have just sucked even more. <laughs> Um, so it's all about like finding where was that error in your thinking? You know, where, where was that mistake? Um, another example, uh, I got a divorce, um, you know, Aaron and I separated in 2009 and then you know, eventually got the divorce done after that. So that was a surprise too. And, you know, the expectation was like, okay, if you get married, it's going to continue. Um, I wasn't expecting to get a divorce when I got married, of course. And, you know, ultimately there, um, the, what I traced back to the error in my thinking was that compromise leads to happiness. And for me, it didn't. And I think for Aaron, it didn't as well. Uh, and I thought, you know, where did I get that belief? And I probably got it, you know, picked it up from TVs and movies and things like that, where you have, you know, this situation of opposites attract and they get together and they somehow make some compromises. And it just seems like this is the you know common relationship strategy that's taught that we should bend to make the relationship work and move towards the middle. So if you want to go this way and your partner wants to go that way, 
you you both just come to the middle. But that means you're not getting what you want and your partner's not getting what he or she wants. And so how was that actually a good thing? <laughs> um, and, and it was this idea that it's important to preserve the relationship. I remember listening to a Tony Robbins audio program many years ago, and he said, you know, one of the key lessons to make a happy, healthy relationship was never threaten the relationship. And I thought, you know, that was a, that was a belief I tried to hold to for, for many years, albeit somewhat unsuccessfully. <laughs> um, and what's interesting is I found out, you know, Tony Robbins was preaching that while he was married to um, his wife, uh, Becky, and, and then, of course, they got to divorce. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, it didn't work for him any better than it worked for me, <laughs> that, that rule of never threaten the relationship. Um, and, and I realized, you know, um, you know, perhaps Tony learned the same lesson there that I did, that um, compromising and moving towards the middle uh, doesn't really work in the long run. And I remember him saying that he, he left his wife, uh, Becky, because, or, or they split up, I don't know who initiated it, um, because of a difference in the desire of the pacing in their lives. You know, he was like this go, 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 you know, uh, person, and, and I think still is, and she was, you know, probably had more of a softer touch and wanted to take things a little bit slower. And I saw some of that same pattern in, in my relationship with Aaron, although I'd say, you know, our main compatibility different, uh, differences were were you know, they were different than, than that. Um, but just a difference in what we wanted to do lifestyle wise. And one thing that made it worse, um, interestingly, is that as we started making more money, it gave us each more ability to express our lifestyle desires. When we were broke, of which was you know the case for many of the early years in our relationship, um, that compatibility issue was largely hidden because our ability to use money to express these lifestyle desires was limited. I couldn't spend a lot of money on travel and things like that because uh, I didn't have it to spend, and and she couldn't spend it on you know other things she wanted like nesting or a bigger house and things like that, um, and so it you know it wasn't really that big a deal. Um, but as we started making more money, then of course that that can be exposed more. And we were, I think, really good at compromising, maybe too good. And that was the problem that I think was the problem that that um, got us trapped and and got us stuck. And I think desire wise, you know, as we went forward, there was more of a divergence in which way we wanted to go. And that really played out after we um, after we separated and then divorced. Um, you know, now that's been um, about seven and a half years since we separated, it's, uh, you know, it's been interesting to see how our paths have totally diverged. Like with each passing year, I think we've gone more and more just different directions. <laughs> um, so it's like we were just, you know, tr trying to pull too close to the middle and, and that wasn't working. And that was just like, you know, our expectations were out of alignment. This idea that that compromise leads to happiness just didn't serve us. Um, it, it leads maybe to some sense of false security. It leads to staying in your comfort zone, but I really didn't see that it led to long-term happiness and fulfillment. And so the lesson then, you know, when you go through these, you analyze these, these failure experiences, um, and you know, in some cases, you might find the word failure a bit harsh. I, I you know sometimes I think of it a bit harsh to apply the word failure to a divorce, because surely there were good things in that relationship, and there were lessons. That was certainly the case with with me and Aaron. Um, there were a lot of good things about our relationship. A lot of things I learned about it. A lot of things I really appreciated about it and and value it. I don't regret having that relationship. Uh, you know, it's just that I'd learned some some powerful lessons from it, um, and. You know, so the next step, of course, is to upgrade your expectations, to refine them. I don't think it's it's necessarily the case that we can have no expectations because the way our brains work is that they naturally predict things. You know, you you pick up a pen, for instance, and your your brain will predict how much it'll weigh. If this pen weighed twenty kilograms or twenty pounds, you would notice. You know, you would be surprised. You would notice the difference, and your brain would start trying to figure out what's going on there. So, uh, predictions happen all the time. It's how we are able to you know, understand um, each other when we speak because we're predicting, you know, what's going to be said next. Um, you know, if, 
it's, it's just a natural part of human speech. It's a natural part of our brain's wiring. So we can't help but make predictions. But the key is to get those predictions into alignment with, with actual reality as much as we can. So that's a constant process of refinement. Obviously, our brains will do that automatically to some degree, but sometimes the unconscious processes make mistakes, and that's when we can kick in our conscious thinking and analyze it a bit more and come to some conclusions and actually upgrade our thinking that can then get stored in our subconscious when we start um, encountering similar situations. So the, the upgrade I made in you know my expectations um, in the first case with the bankruptcy uh, was that I expected or I began to, I didn't fully expect it yet, because it was still a bit new to me, but I thought and I questioned um, that maybe if I focus on happiness and lifestyle, that would lead to financial abundance as well. That if I made those factors higher up, and because I, I could see a pathway there, I thought, you know, maybe if I focus on happiness more, I'll be more motivated and I'll work better, I'll be more relaxed when I work, I'll enjoy my life more and it won't be this process of like, okay, you know, here's the work I have to do to earn happiness. Like that was a mistake in my thinking. Instead, it was like, no, let's just create happiness and then we'll work from the place of, of being happy. And, uh, and I remember uh, Tony Robbins on one of his audio programs mentioning a similar lesson. So I think he probably figured out much the same thing. Um, I think he called it the difference between, you know, achieving um, to be happy versus happily achieving. So that's a that's kind of a cool lesson there. Um, and that, you know, that mindset has served me well ever since. <laughs> uh, since since 1999, it's been great. So that's the cool thing is when you make one of these adjustments, you can just, you know, sail and have all kinds of wonderful success experiences just because of that one little shift in your thinking. Um, in the, in the second case, in the divorce, uh, you know, the, the upgrade I made there was that com basically I, I increased the weight of compatibility in my, in my decision making of, of, about relationships. I realized compromise sucks <laughs> in the long run. It's doable in small situations like, you know, you want to go out to dinner at different places. You want to see a different movie. No big deal. But if you're talking about significant lifestyle decisions and directions, um, you want to go in directions that are just not really that compatible, that is a big deal and it's going to get worse over the long run. And it's not something you should just squash to move towards the middle. So um, I began, you know, over, well, I began, uh, you know, giving much higher weight to compatibility. And I began thinking about like, what, what, what would be like the ideal woman for me? What would be the ideal partner? And I made a list of, of things I wanted to attract. And what was really interesting is that my future partner, who well, was now my current partner, Rochelle, for the last seven years, um, she made a similar list, like maybe that same, maybe earlier that same year. And, uh, you know, when we compared lists, it was like, wow, we're, we're like a really amazing match for each other. Like we just matched. It was like, if not a hundred percent, it was really close. Um, and that was, you know, that's been really powerful. Uh, to to have that experience and the amazing thing is like this relationship has been ridiculously easy you know I remember in my relationship with Aaron I felt like we often had to come together and work on it like we'd have some some of these sessions where we'd meet together and like okay we have these issues let's talk them through let's work on this and um, you know Rochelle and I don't need to do that like, we, well, you know, we'll make decisions together and resolve problems and things like that, but it's not like we feel we have to come together and work on the relationship. We, you know, it, it's more like we simply enjoy the relationship and we just enjoy the heck out of it. <laughs> um, it's just, it feels so much lighter. It's, um, you know, it, it struck me as almost ridiculously too easy how, um, how certain things are with... A, um, an even more compatible partner, like with a partner that you're super compatible with. Um, you know, so many things I would suggest to Aaron and it'd be like, eh, you know, I could see the resistance and we'd have to talk through the resistance and come up with some kind of compromise. And that was such a big part of our relationship. With Rochelle, it's like, as soon as the words are out of my mouth, she's like, let's do it, you know, or yes. It's like, 
it's like you had me at hello, you know, for the movie Jerry Maguire. And if you haven't seen Jerry Maguire, go see it. It's a great movie. Um, and then you'll know what that line means. But the, you know, the, the idea is that if you have super high compatibility, then compromise is not nearly as big a part of the picture. You know, it comes in play in small things, but it's, it's not like a major ongoing part of your relationship. And when that goes away, wow, it's like the relationship just becomes so much easier to, um, to enjoy. Instead of having to work on it, you just spend your time reveling in how good it is. <laughs> um, and that's a really cool place to be. And so that's another case where upgrading your expectations really makes a huge difference. And it's, you know, in this case, it was about um, dumping the expectation that compromise is a good idea, that compromise will lead to happiness, and instead elevating the expectation that no, compatibility rules. <laughs> love is important too. Great to be in love. Uh, Rochelle and I are very much in love, and that matters a huge deal. But that alone is not enough to create a really strong, fulfilling relationship got to have just massively high compatibility. And if it's like, you know, one in a million people that will have that kind of compatibility for you, then find that one in a million person. Um, it, it's so worth it. Uh, you know, what's, what's interesting is I saw in the, in the news recently that uh, there's a museum of failure opening up in Sweden in June. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was seeing some of the examples of like what's going to be exhibited in that museum. So I'll share some of these with you because you can, you know, the, the, it's often easier to, to figure out where the error in judgment was when you see somebody else's problems or somebody else's mistakes rather than your own. So here's the, here's the first example. Um, you know, one of the failures was, and these are generally business failures, like marketing failures, <laughs> the products they created that just didn't sell or they became flops for one reason or another. So how about, um, Harvey Davidson Eau de Toilette. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, okay, so does that mean I'm gonna smell like a motorcycle? <laughs> so that, you know, there's a case of brand extension, um, maybe that takes things a little too far. Like sure, extend it into clothing and things like that, but you know, taking a motorcycle company and applying it to cologne or perfume or whatever, I don't know, that's pretty iffy. Um, <laughs> so that was a marketing flop. How about, uh, Bic pens for her. <laughs> like, you know, Bic, the pen company, actually decided to create a separate line of pens for women. So where's the error in expectation there? Maybe the expectation that women would like that idea? <laughs> that they would assume that, hmm, this pen is designed for men, and so I need something different because I'm a woman? Who knows? <laughs> um, and of course, the famous Google Glass. Uh, where's the expectation of that? You know, the glasses you had, the, the camera built in. Um, and I think the problem there was that uh, Google underweighted how much people would care about their privacy. Um, and so what happened was, of course, you know, locations where people were using those started banning people from going into the places and <laughs> wearing those things because people thought they were being filmed all the time. Uh, so, you know, they, they expected that maybe the privacy aspects wouldn't be such a big deal, and it turned out to be a much bigger deal. Um, and maybe there were other issues with it too, but that was, you know, one thing that comes to mind. Um, and the last example would be the Segway. So that motorized, you know, vehicle you stand up in for personal transportation with the big two wheels on the side and the handlebars. Um, and maybe that, you know, why did that fail? Like, what was the mistaken expectation there? Well, one thing I remember is when it came out, the price seemed extraordinarily high, um, you know, several thousands of dollars. And I'm thinking, well, walking is free, <laughs> and this thing costs like you know about as much as a used car. So, you know, I don't know. It's like I just didn't see the point of it. Um, it also, you know, when I thought about it, I thought, well, that just makes me feel lazy to need this wheeled vehicle to go all over the place. Another thing is that there's more potentially more comfortable um, competition. Like you can get, you know, a wheeled scooter or something like that. I saw those all over Disneyland when I was there. Those the, like wheeled scooter vehicles. And if you're on the lazy side, then you might want to sit down while you're being um, transported uh, by a motorized vehicle. Or if you're just, you know, not comfortable standing up for a while. So it's kind of like some hybrid between walking and using a sitting down motorized vehicle. Uh, so, you know, but the, this was, you know, the expectation was that this is going to be the future of personal transportation. 
and it's you know it's still around um, I see these things in Vegas now and then but mostly used by tour companies you know like doing tours of downtown so um, it, it doesn't seem to have you know gone too far outside its niche market so you know those are some examples from the Museum of Failure <laughs> opening in June and you know I I think the key here, in fact, I think the reason this museum exists is actually to celebrate failure, is to learn from it, to realize that, hey, you know, mistakes happen all the time. Um, and in an interview I saw with the guy, you know, who um, created the idea for this museum, he said something like, you know, 80 to 90 percent of new innovations fail. Um, I don't know where he gets that statistic or if it's just made up, but, uh, you know, it, it certainly brings to mind that failure experiences are rampant. They happen all the time. If you haven't had major ones yet, you probably will eventually. And then that's the time to do some, you know, analysis of the software running in your mind and what led you to make that decision. Did you make some kind of error in judgment? Did you have some kind of mistake? Um, and again, it's not really that helpful to blame other people or blame yourself. That kind of beating other people up or beating yourself up, eh, it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, in fact, it could just make you sick <laughs> in the long run better to just think, okay, you know, let's look at this a little more objectively. Where was the error in my judgment? And you know, what expectation did I have that wasn't met? And maybe it's even an expectation about your, you know, your current performance level or your skill level that you need to upgrade or how well you perform under stress or how well you perform when you haven't taken a vacation in a long time. Um, or, you know, how motivated you're going to feel under certain conditions. So you might have to upgrade some beliefs about yourself as well. I try to do that in a, as constructive a manner as possible. So I enc encourage you, you know, just to wrap this up, I encourage you to pick a failure experience from your life, especially one that's been bugging you for a while um, or one you're currently dealing with, and, um, you know, go through this process. Like, identify, um, you know, it's really simple. Just identify, if you can, what that erroneous expectation was. Like, what did you actually expect? And, um, you know, and how was that out of, out of alignment with what you actually got in terms of results? And then, you know, ask where you got that false expectation. Why did you believe that? Where did that come from? And keep asking why, 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 as you come up with the answers until you can get to a root, you know, a core belief of some sort that, that you think, yeah, this was the problem. You know, was it like I was overweighting, um, uh, you know, it's this factor or underweighting that factor? And... Um, and then upgrade your expectations. Come up with a new expectation, or at least come up with a new expectation to test. You're not necessarily going to believe these new expectations right away, but the idea then is to explore that expectation, to test it, and start living your life by it, and see what happens. See if it comes out to be a little more true than your old expectation. And of course, this is an ongoing, long-term process. You might go through many rounds of this, continuing to upgrade your expectations and refine them. And that'll just make you a more intelligent person in the long run. And I definitely think it leads to greater happiness when what you expect to happen is more in alignment with, re with reality itself. Um, it just means you're becoming more grounded in truth. You're, you, you know, you're getting a little smarter. That's a good thing. It'll, it'll certainly, in the long run, save you a lot of grief. I'll see you tomorrow.